Welcome back to another edition of the Dirty Verdict podcast. Uh, behind the uh, control room, back in the control room, we've got Amanda Orr, Orr Strategy Group for all your PR needs. And then for the first time, making his debut appearance on the Dirty Verdict podcast, who he's been with us from the very first day, Josh Bellin of Chaos Theory. Chaos Theory. Yeah, Chaos Theory Digital. And so Josh has been doing this since Kyle and I's number first one. And since we were baby, the, baby podcasters. Yes, right when it started. And we uh, he's always been behind the camera. Today, we've asked Josh to join us. And by the way, for his day job, besides doing this podcast, he his company does SEO and website design and enhancement and digital marketing uh, for law firms and any other business in town. So uh, reach out to them if there's something of interest to you, but we'd like Josh to come in because he knows more about this computer stuff than Kyle and I do, which is why Kyle hires him to handle some of his computer stuff. That's a hundred percent true. And not only that, his knowledge on the topic was so far superior to Bill's. We fired Bill. Yeah. Bill was kicked out. He's, uh, he's Bill outside, gone. he's outside knocking on the window. Sorry, not coming in. Uh, because the reason why we have Josh on this tech stuff is we've got a very special guest. Melanie Pita, thank you for joining us. You're so welcome. You're we, oh, and this on the mic gap, yeah, you just kind of lean in a little bit. So we were fortunate to have Melanie's husband, Mike Pita. Was that baby two months ago? Sounds right. Yeah, yeah right after he had left um, insurance defense side to go to the plaintiff side with the friends of the show, the Thiessen firm. And so through that, we learned something about your background and it's something that's very unique. We usually talk about lawsuits and um, injuries and death and um, which is, him. Yes, all kinds of negative things. But it, um, what you focus on is something that's obviously the hot thing of the day, and that's artificial intelligence. Yeah, I do. So t- tell us, what, what is the, your, the name of your company? Foundation AI is the name of the company. Website? is www.foundationai.com. Okay, and what does Foundation AI do? Foundation AI is one of the um, legal tech products that are out there using AI to help uh, law firms seamlessly route documents into their practice management system. So let's say you've got your pleadings and your discovery responses and correspondence and all of those various documents that are coming in from maybe emails, faxes, paper mail, you name it. Um, our software connects up with those, those incoming various sources of case documents and routes them into your practice management system, um, puts them in the case, identifies them by type and notifies the right people. Those documents are there. Um, if a document is urgent to your firm, it notifies the right people that an urgent document's arrived. It does auto calendaring for things like hearings and depositions. And so we're talking about robots that are going to help me fire half my staff tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 it's going <laughs> to. This is the pitch on AI. It's not going to replace people. It's going to make people more efficient. So your staff can be more efficient. You can take more cases. You can't make them more efficient. Your people have better things to do. Huh. Well, that's probably true. You got to like surfing on the internet, playing Brick Breaker, <laughs> solitaire on their computer, watching the NCAA basketball tournament. They yeah. definitely have better things to do. So um, does your software talk, because there's case management that kind of focuses on plaintiff's firms, and then there's some uh, defense firms. Does yours talk to all kinds of different case management programs? Absolutely. The The key point with, and then I'm going to start using words that you may or may not know, but um the key point is whatever that downstream system is, is whether that system has open APIs in place. Which What's is, an open, so API. open API? Think of it like this. Um, you've got a, a neighborhood and you want to get a car to the house in the neighborhood, right? And sometimes there are no streets and so there's no way to get the car into the neighborhood, right? No, no, no streets, no paved roads. College station. <laughs> Perfect. Um, once, uh, once you actually start paving those roads, right, and building those streets, you have an AI. But open AI now is not only do I have the streets, but I have 
the street directly up to the house and into the driveway so the car can park in the garage. So think of it as data being able to be taken from one place and easily inserted into another. And um, they're not having to be a lot of technical lift or change in products to make that handshake happen. Okay. Let's say in practical or uh, real terms, so let's say you're a defense firm, insurance defense firm, and Kyle here has a case against you, and you send in discovery asking for all the medical records, and he dumps 1,500 pages of medical records from different providers, and they're not organized. If at all, how can your product help the defense lawyer synthesize that, figure out what's going on there with that? Well, um, one, whether you're a plaintiff or defense attorney, when you get those responses to discovery, um, they would both flow through our system, and our system would at first look at it and go, oh, it's discovery, right? It's responses to requests for production. Um, it's for the Smith case. And so now I'm going to put this document in that practice management system on the Smith case inside that discovery folder, right? Um, the system will also name it so that you have a standardized naming convention. If a lot of problems in firms is that documents get named by 500 different things, so you can't find them. Um, so we'll name them. But the thing, the documents that are attached, and you've said medical records, which is interesting to me. Um, medical records, if the firm wants to have the medical records identified um, in terms of chronology of, you know, the dates of service, the providers that provided that service, our product can do that. They can identify that, extract that, and pull that data um, for whomever, whatever system's downstream. Um, <clears throat> there are products out there that are starting to dapple in AI to evaluate the entirety of that medical record and to create a summary. Um, they're probably not to the same level of um, having your nurse paralegal and um, do what the nurse paralegal does or your paralegal does. Um, but there are products that are out there. They're starting to be able to, to create some sort of summarization of what's in that record. Hmm. So there you go. How much does it cost? Right. Great question. Um, most AI companies, um, that's a software, right? And it's going to be a software as a service. So you're going to, just like your Netflix or any other, uh, you know, subscription service, you're going to have a monthly subscription fee. Um, and then for our particular uh, product, um, the monthly source subscription fee covers, um, it's by page, how many pages are running through. So how many pages is the as a system evaluating. Um, so our subscription includes up to a certain number of pages, depending on the size of your firm and how many pages you think are coming through. <laughs> but it's pretty reasonable. It's not, you know, in the firms that we're talking with, it's um, less than half, sometimes a fourth of the cost of an employee through the job. Uh, okay, so we we jumped right into the meat of the story. We always like, we're always interested, or at least I am, in people's backgrounds, how they got to where they are now. So where are you? She was born a robot. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> she just recited. Yeah. Human. Uh, so where were you? Uh, where were you raised? Where are you from? I was born and raised in Indiana. Okay. Went to Indiana University. Hoosiers. Hoosiers. Hoosier State. Um, I then went to law school in Iowa. Uh, Drake University. Mm-hmm. And uh, That's in Des Moines? That's in Des Moines. Okay. Yep. See, I learned that from my little trip up to Ames, Iowa, this year. Yeah. yeah. Lot, it's got, Des Moines is a, it's a cool, cool town. It is a cool town. Yeah. And after having lived for three winters in Des Moines, Iowa, I very, very quickly made the decision that I was not going to stay in the Midwest anymore. <laughs> Were you born in Indiana? I was born in Indiana. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how did you... know what? Winter is nothing like a Des Moines winter. And Des Moines winters are crazy yeah the capital of iowa the capital building in des moines of iowa is one of the most beautiful capital buildings you've ever seen dome shaped like a corn stalk isn't it (laughs) well if you want it to be (laughs) no it looks like a palace or something i mean it is beautiful it's beautiful Uh, i highly recommend a side trip well texas whenever playing ames again maybe but do you really need a specific reason to go to iowa go for it I wanted to go to the Field of Dreams field. And you need to see the weather beacon. 
Yeah, of course. Des Moines is the only city I've ever had where they have a weather beacon. And the color of the weather beacon tells you um, what the weather's going to be like. How many tornadoes are about to come? So weather beacon green Insane. means, you know, like wonderful weather is foreseen or something. I don't know. They have words for it. each of the colors, red, blue, yellow. And everyone in the town knows. So if you don't want to use your eyes, but you can walk outside and say, where's that dark beacon? <laughs> Green, all is well. Yes. Red, oh shit, where's my cell phone? Why, why am I staying outside? <laughs> Go back indoors. So from the weather beacon to uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Right, okay, so, so how, how, did you te- how did you end up in Texas? Um, honestly, St. Patrick's Day in my last year of law school, uh, Went out with a bunch of friends, didn't go to class. Um, got super hammered and ended exactly. up in Houston. And everybody got super hammered. Why do we always have the same story about everybody getting drunk and ending up living <laughs> in Houston? Because uh, it's true. Same Houston, same thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so they decided and that night, I'm um, going somewhere, somewhere else, and uh, not staying in the, in the Midwest. And ultimately, I decided I was going to go to Texas because I was like, I have nothing holding me back. I could go live where I want to live. And, uh, you know, Texas, I was like, I could t- pass the bar exam and work in any city in Texas. Sure. That's what I did. And came to Houston? First, I went to San Antonio, uh, was there, took the bar there, uh, got my first job in San Antonio um, at a Men Mal boutique firm. It was right during the dot com era, and everybody was wanting to live in Austin. Um, salaries for associates were going through the roof. Um, and, uh, you could quickly jump from one firm to the next and pretty much double your salary overnight. And that's ultimately what I did. I did that too. Yeah. But which firm did you go to? I first in Houston went to McFall, Short and Sheehy, Mm -hmm. um, defense firm, um, and, uh, worked under John Serpy at Mal firm. Yeah, sure. And, uh. Was there for a little over a year, and um, one of my mentors, uh, was older than I was, and um, a good friend, uh, she had previously worked with Cooper and Scully in Dallas, and they were wanting to open an office in Houston, and she convinced me to go to Cooper and Scully and stayed there until I left the practice of law. How long? When was that? She was um, probably 2006. Kind of? Well, I left law firm practice. Yeah. And were you, where, where were you and Mike married along the way? We were married um, right, probably a year after I left the law firm. Got it. Okay. So left the law firm to go do, what did you do in 2006? Uh, I worked for a TPA um, that managed medical malpractice cases. Um, and at that point in my career, I was really looking for um, stability in terms of my schedule. When I was practicing at Cooper and Scully, I, I was in trial several times during the year. And oddly enough, the cases I was a part of were, you know, in the Valley or in El Paso or Corpus Christi. And, uh, Right after Mike and I met, I actually, when Mike and I let, met, I was in the middle of a trial in Dallas, and he was like, oh, that's cool, you know, great, you're in trial for three months, and then after you start dating somebody, and and you're both trial attorneys, and I was like, oh, wait a minute, uh, you're never in town. No, I'm not. Are we going to have kids, or what's the plan? So um, I was really looking for something that enabled me to em- employ my love of law, um, but also I was very interested in technology. And, uh, so ultimately I, um, ended up leaving and working for a legal services company, um, in Houston. And, uh, that legal services company was also in the process of, um, building out an electronic medical record for hospitals. And, I was very interested in that just as a result of my experience in mal cases and looking at those medical records were horrible. It was horrible to try to figure out what was in the record, what had happened and so forth. I thought there has to be something better. Um, and through that process, I ended up learning about technology and product and product development and operational strategy and a whole different mindset as it pertains to 
um, building product and having customers and building an organization and uh, ultimately uh, was part of a product team at another pretty large legal services company in town was there probably I don't know six or eight years or something and then uh, this last year started consulting with Foundation AI and uh, ultimately they asked me to join on as their chief strategy officer and um, been going at it since. So with the uh, the Affordable Care Act, which would have been 2009, wasn't there a lot of money that was put into yeah, I mean, uh, medical record, yeah. uh, to converting everything to electronic and everything? Yeah. The it's, vision at the time was that the, the government wanted every hospital, no doubt, and provider um, to be on an electronic medical record. And so they set up provisions for what they call meaningful use, right? And if the provider, the hospital established that they met meaningful use and there was a whole bunch of criteria um, that their product had to do and they had to then ultimately um, produce back to HHS and Medicare, Medicaid, then they can receive um, incentive dollars for the implementation of that product. Um, what you found was that throughout the country, there are hospitals that are not your Memorial Hermans. You know, you've got hospitals that are the community hospitals and the rural hospitals in the country that they just simply could not afford to buy a product like Epic. Epic is the golden standard for electronic medical records. And, and so, um, there were products like the one that um, I was a part of that our focus was on the rural and community hospitals so that hopefully they could get a product in place that could meet the meaningful use standards and hopefully then improve the overall um, documentation of patient care. Sure. Every now and again, I'll still get uh, a client who had to go to like one of these like rural, rural hospitals. Like in, I had one in Oklahoma once and it was like, can you guys send me the records, you know, put them on a CD and they're like, uh, how about we FedEx you a yes. hard copy? And you're like, I guess, I mean, it is the year 2000. Yes. It's pretty crazy that some of these rural hospitals or providers still are operating like with like color and tab files. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. And well, I think you'll even find that even in a lot of practices today, just simply because it is very challenging to, um, at times convert all of the way in which they do the sure. practice into an electronic medical record. I think over time, um, the functionality of those products are changing and the ease of using that, them and getting the data into them is expanding. But even in um, medical records retrieval, um, there's been a huge influx of, of documents coming in that coming from electronic medical records, but you still have a ton of records that are coming in from various paper forms and formats because not every department has sure. an electronic system in place. But still to this day? Yeah. How, what kind of paper records? Are there like like pre-filled forms and someone just checks boxes or something? Or um, you, well, you have anesthesia records, for example, where it, oftentimes the template that they use during anesthesia and they're literally still physically marking off um, vital signs on the page and wow. writing the anesthesia notes on the side um i just had types of records like that i just had a knee surgery and i you know they they shave your leg or whatever limb they're about to cut on and then my doctor says okay put your initials so we know which leg and so i read he wasn't really paying attention and i like to joke with doctors because i think they're funny and uh so i like wrote cut here uh, and then like a couple little dots <laughs> and then i wrote my initials and then he took a photo of it i was like this is going in the record so <laughs> Uh, okay, Josh, I'm going to allow you a forum to ask some questions. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Sure. Okay, so uh, sometimes, um, you know, as a, as a tech, you know, preparing for trial, I can see how this could be useful uh, in organizing documents and evidence and things of that nature. Can this can this software um, can it can it read or it take intake like video evidence? No, ours is not. But there are software out there that do that there is um, some really nice AI out there that that's its only purpose is to look at um, videos to look at transcript from the video mm -hmm. to help you um, identify the content to mm -hmm. identify the even mm -hmm. the intonation mm -hmm. um, the feeling 
that yeah. people had. That were, the sentiment. Yeah. Yeah. At the sentiment yeah. and yeah. where the sentiment may be changed. But, you can identify like if it's happy questions, like happy responses or poor responses. I shot the sheriff. And I shot okay, that, what, okay I, I don't want to let that pass. So the AI can kind of tell like, hey, this is where Kyle was very nervous in this question. Like maybe, maybe he wasn't being truthful. I don't know if they can go as far as being truthful, but it definitely can identify change in competence. Check it out. Right. Like tell you like, hey, you should probably look right. at this part. Like negativity. And that's how I beat that- AI because I never tell the truth, but I'm also very confident. When I read depo- <laughs> deposition transcripts, I always look for the parts where it's like the sidebars because that's where I'm like, okay, now I know where the good stuff was because that's when the lawyer started fighting. 100%. Uh, okay. Well, that is fascinating that it can that that it can do that. Um, so in terms of, you said that you can, it can create calendar appointments and things yeah, of that nature. Um, can, so does that mean it, it integrates with your, um, through the API through with your business applications, like on, you know, like calendar outlook, that kind of thing. And also the incoming software that the documents come from or. Yeah. So one, you think about where are the document's coming from, right? Mm-hmm. Are they coming from a fast machine? Are they coming through an email? Do, you, do a digital law firm have a like general service inbox where doc, documents are served upon you? Mm-hmm. Um, does your firm still have paper mail that someone's opening and scanning, right? Mm-hmm. Um, all of those document um, sources, we integrate with those and pull the documents from those, right? The documents then run through the system and then from a downstream perspective, we're going to ask, what's your practice management system, right? More likely than not, we've already integrated with them. Um, Clio, Litify, Smokeball, Smart Advocate, and there's tons of them out there. Um, but then also, we ask from a calendar perspective, are you using Google Calendar, are you using Outlook? Like, what is the, what's your mode for, for calendaring in your firm? And um, yeah, integrate with that as well. Which document management Soft, sorry, which practice management software companies are doing the best to integrate and accommodate AI products? Or some of the best. We don't want to single out anyone in yeah. particular. But. Um, from what I see in the market, um, and many of them we are working and partnering with as well, um, across the board in the market, I will say this. Every practice management system is doing something in their product to incorporate AI. Right now, is it because AI is just think of AI as a form of technology, right? It doesn't solve all of the all of the potential problems within a law firm or um, all the potential areas that could be automated in one way or another. So you're going to have companies that are focused on niche areas, right? Their AI, they're going to train their AI to do a very specific thing or to be a software, right? That does a very specific thing. Your practice management systems, because they're trying to ensure that their customers are happy within the practice management environment, they're spending their efforts doing any AI work in in those environments. They're not spending their time doing the AI work of all of these other niche businesses that are out there that are integrating in with their products, right? So. The, the ones that are out there that are really wanting to create an entire ecosystem for their law firms to choose from will often have marketplaces, right? And they'll say, these are companies that we've partnered with, we've already integrated with, it's easy to install. Um, Smokeball is one of them. I think, I, I don't know about y'all, but I get a lot of stuff from Smokeball in, in Texas. Actually, webinars they offer for free on... So one, kind of randomly, we... Uh, decided to use Smokeball starting about three years ago. Yeah. And we have probably used every major document firm management practice software that's existed. And just people who don't practice law don't understand like the tangled nightmare of keeping track of calendars, pleadings, discovery, medical records, confidential records. Like it's a, it's a whole another nightmare. Case law, all that stuff. And I've been super, like, not to toot Smokeball's horn too much, but, like, they've done a fantastic job of, like, they idiot proof the software. Like, my staff can't screw it up. It's pretty. Or you. I mean, 
No, no, no. I don't actually. Someone else. There's a team of people making sure I don't. I'm not allowed to touch a computer. Yeah. I'll get like jam in it, or I'll cram a crayon into the hard drive. I'm not allowed to touch anything. But my, st- I'm too stupid for that. But my staff seems to really like Smoke Bowl. Yeah. But they're doing a pretty good job of the Smoke Bowl Smart Advocate is another one that's out there. Um, I see Spy. If y'all, I see Filevine a lot. Yep. Um, Filevine. People will copy me on. I send a proposal or something, and they'll respond. And copy Filevine with the yeah. Filevine email. So that's the only reason why. So for we always one. We always one. The, and they're all also, you know, each of those practice management systems, they also focus on different uh, niche markets, right? Sure. Some of them are um, more plaintiff than defense. And some of them are more, um, you know, law firms under the size of 20 attorneys versus law firms over 20 attorneys. So they, um, they each... Each one of them, you know, definitely has their target market space that they're focusing on, but they all have some sort of a plan for creating market places so that their firms can, you know, leverage the the best that's out there that solves that particular firm's needs, right? Um, so, so how long do you think before attorneys are simply replaced by like some sort of AI cognition system? Never. Really? Really? Well, here's why. Because this has come up. We've talked about this on when we do news. Is people have tried to have briefs written by the AI. Yeah. And it, it's it, and there's two components to this. Um, I was going to ask you about it. In those situations where the lawyers got in trouble, the AI bought just like made up cases. Phantom. Yep. And what do they call uh, hallucinations? Yeah. Is that the term? Yeah. So and so in this particular case that we're talking about. A guy was sanctioned. But there's been several since. Yes, yeah. he submitted a brief with case law that was made up. But he, in part, got out of the sanction because he printed out the questions he had asked the AI machine. And the question was, are these cases real or is this bullshit? And yeah. the AI responded, these are real cases. And, and he was like, I didn't. He was like, because if you think about it, Westlaw, in part, yeah, just, there's some trust. Just an AI machine, especially with how their search terms are structured, it's not all that different, you know, doing Westlaw research and doing AI research, asking somebody else to create it for you. Good point. But, I mean, that guy, he got him a fair amount of trouble mm-hmm. uh, by using AI, but the AI lied to him. Yeah, if it did, and he tried to fix it. So, yeah, the hallucinations is that, and I, there's a, we're going to talk about this news story. Um, I think it was one of the Canadian airlines has a chat bot and um, someone, you know, someone was like, Hey, can I change my flight? Is there a charge or something like this? And there's like, no, no charge, change it. And then it turned out there was like a $300 charge. And he's basically, you know, reliance, all the promissory estoppel. And he won, this is in Canada. I don't know why you'd sue over 300 bucks or, or $80. Yeah, exactly. It's like three twenty five. But that was the same thing. It was a hallucination. So how, if you're, and I'm kind of being like a devil's advocate question. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're a lawyer and you're a little leery of jumping into this AI thing because of these, because we don't, you know, let's say your thing on your calendar and it says, oh, your deadline for the summary judgment response is March 1st. Mm-hmm. And it was really like March 1st you know, or March 8th and you miss a deadline and you go into court and go, I've got this AI program. It told me it was fine. Um, how do you alleviate some of those concerns? Yeah. So there's different types of AI. The example that you gave with the attorney that relied upon AI to generate a brief for whatever he was using it for, that is generative AI. So if we think of like chat GPT, I don't know if you've ever played around with him, mm-hmm. but Chat GBT is your chatting with something that's going to generate an answer for you, right? It's searching all of its, um, you know, knowledge base to try to come up with an answer for you. Um, generative AI, in terms of accuracy, um, can have some issues, right? Like with the hallucinations. There's other AI that's using something called natural language processing. It's not creating creating a generative outcome. It's literally looking at, in our instance, it's literally looking at something that is hard and fast real, a, a document, right? 
And it's looking at a document and extracting information that is on that document. And then the next piece of that is what is the accuracy rate, right? What is, based on your models and the outcome, how accurate is that information that's coming out? And if it's not right, what does your product do? Does it automatically send something on to be calendared? Or does the software stop and go, wait a minute, I can't tell if that is an eight or if that is a three, right? Is it March the 8th or was it March the 3rd that this hearing is taking place? Um, so any AI product that you that you work with, it needs to have a component in it called human in the loop. So what? Human in the loop. So in that- That's when my staff takes that piece of paper, puts it in a banker's box and then hides it under their desk. <laughs> that's out of the loop. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Having the capability for your for your product to one have a really high um, rate of accuracy is key. But then, secondly, the ability for the product to know what, to identify to know what it doesn't know to say I'm not sure about this. I'm not 100 percent sure, and I need someone to verify or correct that for me. Um, for our product, because of the millions and millions of documents that have ran through the system. Um, our accuracy rate is very high on those standard types of, um, one, identifying the right matter, the right document, and so forth in, th in the system, and then also doing the calendaring extraction. So we're upwards of 90 plus percent that will automatically go through um, with accuracy. And the system um, will identify on, you know, on occasion 10 percent that needs someone to come in and take a look at it and say, hey, you know. So it knows enough to, to it knows enough to know what it doesn't know and it needs help on. Exactly. And any product, any AI product you're talking to, you want to make sure that, that that's the answer they're giving you. If they tell you, oh no, you said it and forget it, that's a pile of that's a pile of shit. That's not true. Um, that's an AI term. Uh, yeah, yeah, pile of shit. Yeah. Um, it's just simply not true. Um, you you should never have something in place where you just think you're gonna set it and forget it. Um, because just like humans, you know, AI, um, yes, their AI is much, much more accurate than, you know, human error, but there's still, you have to have guardrails in place and, um, thinking that you're just going to build a product and have it automatically run and there never be an opportunity for there to need to be valid validation is just not true. How long until I can talk to my AI friends like I talk to Alexa and say, bring me the motion for summary judgment in the Jones case. Or draft it? No, no like like find it and send it to me, open it up. Oh, okay. oh, that's pretty easy. You probably do that today. Okay. How about draft a response? Here's the MS motion for summary judgment in the Jones case. Draft an initial response. There are products that are already doing that today. There are okay. products that are already drafting um, demand letters, demand packets. It's looking through all the data in your system. And you say, I'm going to create a demand packet. It goes through, it pulls all the information, it creates the demand letter for you, and obviously you should look at it huh, before I, you send it out. I am so tired of reading and thinking and typing. <laughs> that, that sounds good. I thought you way to add a rope. Is that even up? It is. Okay. I get a lot of ads for them on my Instagram and yeah. various feeds because I follow lawyers of all sides. And now is there a AI software that can talk to my clients for me? Uh, in some ways there are. Well, there's chat bots, right? I mean, they're all, they're, yeah. chat bots are, are typically set up to triage, right? Yes, More. That, oh right for like your marketing purposes and incoming. But also there's AI products like uh, Esquire Tech, for example. It's uh, a product that is used in discovery so that when you're trying to capture the responses that you need from your clients, instead of you, um, having to call them or set up a meeting or whatever. Um, it's AI that one generates what it thinks the response is, but two um, connects up with your client so that your client can give their shortened answer and the AI then turns it into something that's actual legalese. Is that verbal, like on a phone or is that type a like chatbot? Uh, I believe their product is one that's uh, sent at, like, over the email or maybe through a text. Yeah. So that would be interesting because if you're entering Discovery and you just input Kyle Harbert social 
whatever your social is, date of birth, TDL. And then you just have this thing programmed and they call or text with this person and go, Hey Kyle, we see you're, you've had the last three addresses at blank. Cause that's usually a discovery question. Last three address. Is that right? Yes. Uh, we see you've been, you know, they run an ISO report. We see you've had, cl- you had a wreck and here, here, is that right? Yes or no, or whatever. That's not me. I mean, you can, we can write email like getting honest answers from your clients to, <laughs> to give to the other side. Yeah. Or a sense of it. Nah, we're not. But what is that one called where you can use that uh, for That's the client? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So do you partner kind of with different people, different it, um, programs that AI have different? Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we, the AI legal tech space is one that's pretty tight knit. And so we all know of each other. Right. Um, and, uh, and definitely know each other's products and clients and, and so forth. So, but we don't really, um, you know, necessarily sell or promote each other. Yeah. Are there any, um, consultants that will like a concierge, like, Hey, there's, we're in this emerging field right now. So there's not a Walmart or Amazon all, you know, get everything. I can kind of what do you call it? Bespoke, um, put together Pretty some good. stuff uh, that of the different programs that fit your needs. So the closest to that that I've seen is where you've got a practice management system and it has their marketplace, yeah. right? So where they'll say like, these are all of the options that are out there that um, are integrated with our product already. And so you can pick and choose which of these best suit your particular firm's needs. So I want to ask a question that I don't think it's silly, but it might sound silly. So I guess the difference between like a, what I would call a dumb computer system and AI is I guess AI learns as it goes and it adapts and changes. Is that right? Yeah. You you teach AI to learn and you, and you teach it just like think about teaching a child. You've got to repeat and repeat and repeat to, to teach it how to do the thing you want it to do. So is your AI like having this experience with all these lawyers and all these law firms and learning how to handle these documents with increasing efficiency. I mean, is that, is that the basic jam? It's absolutely the basic jam. Um, and you think it also as, uh, so you might go from state to state and what personal injury attorneys do in Texas might be a little bit different sure. document wise. If you go to, let's say New Jersey or Montana, um, so you want your models to be smart enough so that irrespective of what state you go into, um, or what type of civil litigation, um, is being managed by the firm that it's smart enough to know that, you know, this is this type of document. Yeah. So how long until you can basically handle what Mike Pita does on a daily basis? Like AI, make Mike Pita coffee, make Mike Get, get Mike Pete of the news. Wait a minute. And I think it's supposed to be reverse of that. Right? Exactly right. So that was my next question. Yeah. I think it's more like AI I to make Melanie Pete a coffee. Pick, pick up <laughs> Melanie's dry cleaning. Change Melanie's yes. oil. And I think he would like that as well. Uh, he's He doesn't like to be a volatile a lot. But yeah, he, well. unfortunately, that kind of happens sometimes. Do you, do you think, um, are there particular states or, re, or regions where you feel like the lawyers are further ahead on adopting this versus... Others, um, California for sure is ahead of the curve. Um, also, seeing some really strong headway in New York. Um, Florida's taken pretty good s- step forward in that regard. Um, the bigger, as is with any sort of. Um, Legal services, uh, it's also happening the same with legal tech. So any of the major hotbeds for litigation, those states and those cities and those states is where you're seeing it take a hold the most. How about, is, I assume the mass tort guys got ahead, gals got ahead of this in front of everyone. Yeah. So mass torts for sure um, are heavily um, interested in, in using it. Um, and the interesting thing with them is that uh, a lot of them are using Litify because each of the ways in which they want to handle those cases a little bit unique, it's a little bespoke based upon the type of case that it is. And and um, and so they're able to um, 
Litify is is very flexible. It's built on Salesforce, if you know Salesforce. Um, and so they can manipulate the way in which uh, they have the data they want to capture and how they want to capture it. Um, but definitely, I mean, if you think about the massive numbers of of clients they're managing at a time and the, and the documents that are coming in and just getting through them all. Yeah. And then the Huge value to them. financial backers <clears throat> probably are happy to finance a yeah. new shiny computer AI system. There you go. <laughs> and they want them to because they want them to succeed. They've got a lot of money invested in it, right? I mean, absolutely. I mean, the crazy thing is for any of our listeners that aren't lawyers is – the amount of time we actually spend doing thinking brain lawyer work is incredibly small. I think in comparison to the amount of document management review drudgery. Sure. Um, so, I mean, like for me, a system like Smokeball, just so I can find things easily is a game changer. Uh, and synthesize them. Right. And, 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 and also you, you said the great thing about AI is a, is a AI system shouldn't tell you when it's lost. It shouldn't tell you when it's confused. Yeah. When it, when it doesn't know what it doesn't know. How does it do that? Well, in our, in our product, what it does is, um, we actually have a dashboard and the dashboard will show the respective document and it's something we call system, um, generate review. So, uh, or system documented review. And so it will, our product on the opposite side of the document, there are fields, right, that the system has evaluated and has extracted information out of, and those fields are highlighted for the person to go, hey, we think it's March the 8th, right? But this is the system, like, I'm not sure. So it'll highlight the field both um, on the review side and within the document. It's the person that's looking at can quickly go yes or no, um, validate or edit and update, and off you go. Josh, technical questions. Well, so I've been using, in marketing, I've been using some software that we have to be careful about AI content, you know, being on websites, especially with SEO, uh, digital marketing. And so I found this software that detects AI, right? And it gives like a confidence score based on how likely it is AI. And I was curious with those errors that you were talking about that it finds and it brings the human in the loop. Is it kind of based on like a, does it use sort of a confidence score? I know it's more of a deeper la layer technical yeah, question, but like, yeah. Like terminology, it's a yeah. confidence score. Yeah. And, and the other people that use that are college professors, right? Because yeah. they're checking for oh, yeah. AI. Oh, yeah. Or just, yeah, <laughs> I had some chatbot write the paper, right? So for you kids at home, you can use the AI to do the first draft and the lawyers, <laughs> but you, you need to like do a little... Yes, yeah, stiff it up. A little editing. Yes. <laughs> and Kyle can do that for you. As for 50, to your... 50 bucks, I'll get you a B plus. Yeah. No problem. I have one more question. Yeah. Okay. So how, so in the timeline of things with AI rapid, rapidly uh, evolving and there being a lot of talk, I think AI has been holding back, especially the leaders of AI, because they're worried about what it will do, Right worried about how it might affect the economy the dynamic and the market dynamics things of that nature um how long do you think law firms have before they really need to get on the ball with training their staff on how to train ai and integrate that into their on how to train ai yeah well or do you think that this is a lawyer's job well here, um, so let me ask this question are you saying that the staff is going to train a well, train on the systems and things that you were okay. that you're mentioning. Yeah. So, like, like you know, just getting just getting acquainted with the AI software so that they can teach it. You know, this is how we file. This is how we document. This is the naming conventions we want to use. Things of that nature. So, hopefully, the vendor that you're working with are the product already does those things out of the box, right? Um, and it's more of. Uh, that's the automation part. That is the power of the product, right? And then there's other portions of the product that are configurable um, where the law firm staff would be involved in helping configure it to meet the needs of that firm, right? So an example would be, um, let's say a document comes in that is um, 
a demand letter. If I'm a defense attorney and if I get a demand letter, to me, that's like a hot bucket item, right? And I would really like to look at that today. So a particular firm might say, hey, every time it comes in and you identify this type of document, I want you to, to alert me, right? And I, I don't want just to be a regular alert. I want to be an urgent alert. Mm -hmm. I want you to create a task. Plaintiff's attorney could be something completely different, right? It could be an offer. It could be um, request for admission. I mean, whatever, whatever to that firm is really important to them to be able to configure the system so that it works to power them the way they, they want it to. Um, and I think that law firms, well, they're already moving towards the capability of, of, of doing that. And in the next three to five years, there is going to be a, just a monstrous boom forward. Um, insurance tech has already been moving in this direction for the last 10 plus years. You know, everybody, everybody talks about insurance tech. Is that a product? No, insurance tech is just the concept of using technology um, to help in the insurance space, to evaluate claims, to um, do predictions. You can just, they haven't created a software that just says claim denied, that they just, <laughs> they probably, they just, you know, just hit that button over and over and over. <laughs> well, it's funny because um, the insurance tech has uh, stuff to assess claims. So then the plaintiff side should then have one that, talks to the insur insurance that's tech. what i'm saying like how long until we're replaced yeah you just put you get the this insurance tech to go on a date with plaintiff's lawyer tech and they just spit out a check tell the number yeah spit out a check yeah which would be fine with everyone yeah maybe They're just how, except for me because that takes me in takes it takes me out of the equation but it's fine oh mediator tech i don't know what it would be mediator tech would be like Hey, insurance. Hey, they, can't well, just, hey. they can't agree, right? Yeah. Going yeah, that, yeah, when you have those exceptions and the yep, 10%, that's where I come in. Yeah. Mediator tech comes on. So the technology that you currently have and is out there in the market, mm -hmm. one of the reasons I like Smokeball is because it's intuitive. It almost requires zero training. Right. Right, like the call will come in, it'll get turned into a message. It will go to the person and it will say, where do you want to save me? You can't leave this page until you save me to right. file. Yeah. Would you like this file? And y'all's system right now, or systems like it, what's the random up time? Is there a bunch of training, or is it the kind of thing where I turn it on and it says, hey, Kyle, where do you want your files to go? Like, how, how, how much training is required? Um, there's typically a four to six week implementation period, right? And in that implementation period, um, one, obviously we need to know what your practice management system is. And then we need to talk to you about configuration, you know, what, what document types are the types that need to have urgency, um, the taxonomy. So for instance, um, we might call something a correspondence and your firm like might like to call it letters, for example. Um, so setting it up so that as they come in, they make sense to you, right? Even though our system's thinking of it as another thing. Naming conventions. How do you want it to be named? Things like that. I mean, if it gets a name at all, I'm super impressed with my staff. Yeah. Well, guess what? You can get a great name. And whatever order you want, you know, date, I get document a, type. I get a lot of document names that are like, a Kyle, you use a GR1279. Uh, <laughs> Kyle, Kyle sucks. G is oh, one. Yeah, yeah. My boss is A-H-O-O-O-O-L-E-0-0-0. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that, we're hiring nothing but the best of best. So, yeah. So, but really, you, I would say, Melody, is it fair to say that just like training your staff and, you know, 20 years ago on how to use Word or Excel or it's far easier? <laughs> yeah. Far easier. But <laughs> Tell me that's going to be, this is going to be a requirement going forward. Like, you're going to need an AI component to your practice and you're going to, like, your staff is just going to have to yeah, be trained on it. Uh, you're going to, Need an AI component, you're going to have several AI components, right? Um, I had a call with a, an attorney that last week, and she's like, you know, I'm just looking for um, one vendor that can do it all for me, right? Every, every type of AI thing that comes in my mind, every potential project, I just want one vendor to do it all. And so what we started talking about is that you think of these as, as products, that have been specifically trained to do very specific jobs. 
I think that in the future, you'll have a lot of M&A that happens, right? Where companies will go and gobble up all of these, you know, AI companies that do very specific product functionality and maybe put them under one umbrella, right? So you could have one master large company to negotiate with. Um, but where we are today is that you've got, you know, companies that have very niche products that solve very specific problems. And there's no question, firms are going to... Um, choose those products as they make sense for them, you know, where they want to invest their time and their effort in any given year. And, um, yeah, I, you're going to see firms, you know, probably have three or four different types of products in place that, that really help to serve their firm. What's your favorite movie about AI? Oh gosh. There were, when there are me. <laughs> the girl, the, the, the scary one with the girl, you know, she was like a, the doll, she looked like Dell. Oh, oh, no. I just, what, like, uh, what is her Minority name? Report. No, it was Emma. The, um, it was out of the silver, the uh, gold, the. Oh, yeah, she's a, yeah. Like, she had a name like Annie or Emma, Emma or something. And it was this horror movie. What was the one with uh, Joaquin Phoenix where he falls in love with the his AI bot? The Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. Oh, remember the one with the boy who. Yeah. Oh, is, that one was called say isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. To buy himself and he thinks that he a fairy, he goes underwater and Megan. 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 Yeah. Okay. Josh, any more technical questions? Or are you tapped out? No, I think it's fascinating, but I don't, I don't think I have any other technical questions. Okay. So what would you, so start with planners firms. What would you recommend that they do? Someone comes in as like, we don't, we've got paper stuff and PDFs, but we don't know what's going on. What would you recommend to them as far as how AI can enhance their practice or help them help their clients? Yeah. So from a document management standpoint, um, which is managing the incoming documents into your firm, um, by having a product like Foundation AI in place, one, it helps you to ensure that all the documents that are getting into your coming into your firm on each day are getting into the right cases and timely, right? You're not having to wait two, three, five days, however long it takes for someone to get it into your to your file. Um, secondly, it's helping you by alerting the people that need to be alerted that that document has arrived. Um, it's something a paralegal needs to know about because this response to discovery they need to you know, create a summary on or something. Um, is something that you, as the attorney that's on the case, need to go know about. Um, thirdly, um, because you know that document type has arrived, and at least me in my practice, um, there were times where, and this is way before practice management systems, but where things would come in and they'd get dropped in my box, and I did not find out about them until two or three days later because I didn't get through my inbox fast enough. And um, oftentimes there were, um, you know, uh, little treasures in there that really needed to be done like maybe two days ago um, that had a real impact on um, definitely your stress level, but also, you know, potentially your relationship with your with your clients. And also, especially if you're an associate in a firm, yep. um, you might lose your job. Um, I just want an AI that functions as efficiently as Peter's staff when I'm one day late paying a mediation fee. The seventh grade. But you, if you want an email and triplicate, do they do that? Absolutely. Oh, that's why I pay them big bucks. I get, I get an email, and then I get a phone call, and then I get a. Who is it now, Mr. Herbert? Who is it at your firm that handles accounts payable? Andrew Smith. <laughs> they are, they're they're pretty on top of it. Yeah, I admire. Them. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't know that. So that's but I'll, you I'll know. Pay so them. Mike, for what two or three years, worked from home, and so I got the pleasure of seeing him. Um, Sometimes several times a week, uh, in a flurry, cursing. Um, all of a sudden, he would go from being in his workout clothes to very quickly switching into coat and tie and rushing out of the house. I'm like, "What's going on? They forgot to schedule such and so again, yeah. or um, an attorney is supposed to be covering this and they didn't know about it. This never got on their calendar, and they're off doing something else, and now I have to go cover it." So, and yeah, that's what he was working for. A- very, very big large, company, yeah. very large company that um, you know theoretically had processes in place to mm-hmm. to get these um, things on everyone's calendar. Happens, um, but you know, I can tell you that if you've ever had that happen to you and you have 
a system in place that enables you to one know that something's arrived and secondly actually get it on your calendar or at least at the very least notify the person that's doing your calendaring entries like here's all the data for you right here's all the data for you you now need to decide you know if you want to get this into outlook or or how you want to do it but um you know it's to me it's much more than just routing your documents and giving them to the right cases and right folders it's the importance of getting that information to you quickly and for it to be accurate. Um, and, you know, today, people that are doing it manually, they have just as much opportunity for error, not putting a name, naming convention on it, dropping it into the wrong case and the wrong folder, not getting on the schedule. Um, well, you know, the, the other thing that I think of is every time I lose an employee, which thankfully we have not a lot of turnover, um, but every time we lose an employee, all of that institutional knowledge of where stuff goes, where it's been, how it needs to happen in the future, in part walks out the door. Uh, mm-hmm. That expertise leaves with an employee. Yeah. It would be great if it was consistent, right? Yeah. And it doesn't matter who's sitting at that desk. I, today I was talking to an attorney who has three paralegals and one um, case clerk who's leaving to go to law school um, this fall. And he said, the problem is, one, I really like my paralegals to be doing paralegal work. Um, right now, they're doing a lot of document work. And then secondly, I'm going to lose my, um, my you know, document clerk to go off to law school. And I'd really like to not have to, you know, find a replacement for him if I can, if I can help it. And I really don't want all the additional work that he do- does today to have to fall back on my paralegals who are already overworked. So... Um, like you said, it's great for, you know, allowing you to scale your business, get more cases in and new partners that are added and so forth. And as you'll scale it easily also helps you create consistency. And, um, you know, as those employees happen to leave, um, you know, there's not a mu- as much disruption. So practical question, and this is not an academic exercise. Like I'm totally ignorant of it. I want to add AI as a new component to my practice. Do I reach out to my document, my firm management software company and ask them, do I Google and try and track someone like you down? What or just call her directly? I mean, obviously, I can call you directly. Exactly. Is it, what, what's the portal? Um, I think that the easiest way on uh, today is, one, if you have a document management system or a practice management system, and first I start with your practice management system, I'd go on their website and I'd look to see if they have a marketplace, right? Um, who all do they have on their marketplace? Go to their conference. Um, all of them have conferences each year. They are a phenomenal place for you to see everything that's possible. Um, they have classes so you could go and learn about the latest technology that both what the practice management system is bringing up within its own product, but also its partners. So it's definitely worth a trip to, to whatever conference they're holding. Um, but yeah, look on their website, see who their partnership page, you know, who they have and who they've integrated with. That's super helpful. Um, and then also, you know, like I said, if, whether you go to your practice management systems conference, you go to, um, like there's legal tech in New York each year, huge conference. You want to learn anything about legal tech? Go there. Everything under the sun is there. Um, and then the, all those obviously like state and specific conferences, um, National Trial Lawyers Association just had one in Miami. Um, and the, the Lanier Trial, um, for the Trial Advocate Academy, Academy, um, we'll have their conference at the end of June here. Um, so, you know, all of the vendors are going to be hanging out in those places. And so, you know, easy to kind of track them down and, and see what, what's out there. Yeah, there you go. Easy enough. Yeah. Last, last opportunity, Josh. Tech? Okay, I have kind of a security question. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. That's a good good one. Yeah. Um, so I had a client who uh, had this proprietary technology. They're more of an engineering firm in the oil and gas um, industry. And they have new product names and new... Uh, uh, kind of some new branding elements that they really were afraid of of getting out there so they didn't want to use 
ChatGPT to come up with any concepts or ideas or any type of outlines because they were afraid that this data would be then accessible by other people that queried about their company, right? Right. So how does a document management system isolate that information to the firm and not allow it to... Without sharing it to the rest Without of sharing it. Yeah, if somebody was specifically trying to get information from that, you know, on that firm, maybe they have malicious intent, maybe they don't. You know, maybe it's just an accident. Like, how, how, how does it protect from that? So the, the documents that are coming through, the question is whether or not the... Any client information, mm-hmm. right, is able to be ex- is able to be viewed or known, right? What is being extracted from that document? And secondly, how long are those documents being held? We have um, with our firms the average amount of time that we hold our documents is ninety days. We hold them for. 60, we hold them for 30, whatever the firm desires. Um, the only reason that we hold their documents for any longer duration of time is because they want to be able to have um, the ability to come back if they ever have a question about, like, you know, this document went into um, the Jones case. Um, was there something we need to, if there's something like we're not sure about with respect to that document, like we need to go back and we want to evaluate. Um, why are paralegal validating this to go this place versus another place? So um, we use them for audit purposes. Um, the data on the document itself, um, you want to ask whether or not the, um, you know, is the, is the person or persons or client able to be identified and are you extracting any identifiable information? Um, we can't tell in our system from one firm to the next as to whose document it is or who it isn't. Um, But I will say that there's power in being able to train your system, let's say on a pleading. If the more pleadings you can train the system on from the more, the various states and the different courts and so forth, the smarter and better your AI gets. Okay. There you go. Kyle, any more? I just want to thank you for coming on. Yeah. Uh, Thank Mike for letting you spend an evening with us. And what's the website? It's uh, www.foundationai.com. Okay. I wanted you to know I've... You can do that. All right. Well, thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you. Um, So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Like and subscribe. um, Spotify, Apple, TikTok, Instagram, Instagram, YouTube, all the platforms. And go see Kyle at Kyle at herbertrialaw.com, see me at comomediation.com, see our long-lost friend Bill at fbtrial.com. Okay, yeah, sorry. Bill. Well, yeah, uh, team Josh, yeah, thanks. With Bill. <laughs> I cursed today I saw Bill. Just like Lou Gehrig, right? Uh, he's in. All right, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Good night. Thanks.